Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wildemar Beach Congregational Church. I'm Mary Claire Hansen. Boy, we have a very, very busy crowd here today. This is wonderful. Good to see everyone. Looks like we're getting a little rain this morning. Oh, there's some, some beautiful days we've had the past several days. So welcome, everyone. Please pay attention to our prayer list this week for members and friends of the congregation. Um, also, today, a reminder for people to sign up for fellowship. Um, there's plenty of food back there today. We got a lot of busy cooks, um, but there's a sign up out back there for like six months worth of sign ups. So if you'd like to plan ahead, uh, please uh, look at the list and see what day you might be available. The church council meeting will be held tomorrow night here at the church. Um, if you are a committee head or an uh, officer and you haven't prepared your report yet, please make sure you forward it through email to um, the rest of the committees and the officers. Um, and then you get a break next month. The, we always give July off to, uh, to the council for good behavior. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, the uh, Bible study is finishing up the book of Esther this coming Wednesday. So um, please join us um, in the study of this short book. Um, it's, everybody has uh, had some very good discussion. So, I have Logan and Lucas here with me today. Logan turned six yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's going into first grade. And Lucas is going to go to kindergarten in September. Um, we today is the last chance for you to get your recipes in for the cookbook. Um, so please, uh, if you haven't gotten them in, you can email them. If you're going to handwrite them and you haven't gotten them ready yet, please see me after the service and let me know. Um, and then you can make you can get them to me by next Sunday. But this is the last announcement for recipes. Um, also, if you're still looking to uh, get rid of your cans and bottles, Tom and Lori have been taking them for collection, and the money's been going to our general fund. So that's a big help, and we thank them for that. They are not here with us today. Um, last but not least, birthdays and anniversaries for this week. Lillian Delu Deluise, one years old? Is it one? Huh? Lillian. She's two? She's two, and that's Clint and Helen LaPlante's granddaughter. Jeremiah McGrath, that's the Moss's grandson. Um, I don't know how old Jeremiah is going to be, and the Mosses are, uh, I think, in Pennsylvania again. Continued prayers for um, Denise's mom, who has been having some health issues. And for Ziamara Medina, um, who they moved to South Dakota, I think. and uh, But I think they listen online every once in a while. So happy birthday to Zamara. And we have one anniversary this week, the Garmins. Yes? Do you have an anniversary this week? 56 years. So happy anniversary to Jack and Bobby. Are there any other announcements for this morning? If not, let's please prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning. <laughs> Not uh, in good shape yet, am I? <laughs> Would you please all stand up and join with me in the call to worship? We come as your children, gathering together to worship you. Where there is no singing in our hearts, give us a new melody. Where there is no praise, give us the gift of thanksgiving. You are all we need for gladness. Show us your way for us and set us free. Now open your songbooks to number 28. Holy God, we praise thy name. Amen. I don't think I've sung that one before. That's nice. <clears throat> Please join me now in the prayer of invocation as we pray together. Lord God Almighty, who said that you pour out your spirit on all flesh, who also in fulfilling your word did come upon the company of the twelve at Pentecost. Grant that as often as we celebrate the mighty outpouring of your spirit on the church, we may be stirred up by that remembrance to a desire for its renewal in our day, and that we may not cease to pray for times of refreshment from your presence. Let all who believe be possessed by your Holy Spirit to the glory of your Son's name. Amen. 
You may be seated. But you're not done reading. Join me together in the prayer of confession. Dear Lord, show us our way of life and what we are to do. For we confess we are lost. We want to be of help to others, but we cannot help ourselves. We withhold our gifts out of fear. Free us to be giving. We have forgotten the joy of being really alive. Make us live by the gift of your spirit. Forgive us for not being full-time Christians in this frantic world we live in. And forgive our sins of omission and commission in the silence of this time. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather in your name to worship you this morning, we thank you for the summer day, almost summer day, and the blessings of the week that we've had just past week. And now we begin the service. Uh, we are confessing our need of cleansing and forgiveness. In our prayers, we mention sins of commission as well as omission and not being full-time Christians in this frantic world. So we ask for your forgiveness. We also seek a refilling of your spirit that in this service we would worship you in ways that are pleasing and honoring to you, encouraging, uplifting to these who are gathered as well as others who are listening in, and then enable us to go forth out in this world that we live in, very troubled, to share your message of love, peace, and Pray all this in Jesus' name. He is, he is the Lord. So today is a special day for me because 12 years ago, the second Sunday of June, is when the church called me to be your pastor, 12 years ago. And when I was looking at that book, um, Sand in the Shoes, about life down here at the beach, I found out something. I am now the second longest serving pastor of this church. There were two that served 11 years, Pastor John Thursby before me, and Pastor Hart Inlow, line of Judah Academy. The first uh, pastor, they had uh, a number of visiting ministers the first 10 years, uh, was Howard Meserve, who was actually the city librarian when this library was up there at the end of the green, that Taylor building. Uh, I don't think anybody was here then. 1905 to 1926, he was 21 years. So anyway, um, it's a joy being here. It has been a joy. And how it came about is 13 years ago, I filled in two weeks in August. Uh, Pastor John and before him, um, Pastor White used to use me as a supply preacher. And I remember Pastor John called me and said, uh, I understand your wife is an accompanist. 
uh, our, our uh, organist, pianist, is, is getting kind of frail, not able. Could she come and fill in? Well, she's been filling in ever since. <laughs> and she reminds me that she's been here longer than I have been. Yes. So anyway, it's, it's been a joy. And a lot has been accomplished the last 12 years. And we still have things to do, but a lot has been accomplished. And for instance, you might have noticed that the parking lot looks a little different. Uh, it's been sealed. The cracks filled in. Uh, lines are now out there again. The council had the decision to either treat the parking lot in that way or to repave it. 7,000 versus 25,000. Did they make a good decision? I think they did. Um, and uh, another thing we had in the congregational meeting was putting an air conditioner in the fellowship hall. And we've actually used that the other week. I think it's very handy uh, as well. So one of the first things we did here was put the air conditioning in here, create the nursery over there, a uh, number of uh, things. Uh, grateful that uh, all these things that we've been able to do Sanctuary being redone, the ramp out here, the ladies' room, the men's room, the fellowship hall, have all been money that we raised and paid for. And uh, our uh, endowment fund has come back up to uh, more than what it was. And uh, that's all grateful because of God's people being very faithful. I don't get up here on Sunday morning, put a guilt trip on people, don't beg and plead. People see what's going on, want to be part of it, and they share as they're able. And... Uh, Paul reminds us that we now have about eight or nine months cash reserves versus where we used to have to hit our endowment, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. So this is all this is all very good. This is all very good. We're grateful for those that kept this church going. The years that uh, were some lean years, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, now we can see the efforts of their faithfulness and yours as well. How many of you here today were here 12 years ago. All right, so you can see a few other people have joined us since then. And Lee, I know you were here, and uh, absolutely. Uh, the Mosses, I think, were here visiting that day as well. So we continue our worship now through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. And trust, O Lord, in thee. Amen. And the choir appears, leading us in We Are God's People. At this time, the children can be released to go to Sunday school. And thank you for, for that, the choir, um, the choir. That's the, that's the name, right, the choir? Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to read from Luke today, and if you'd like to follow along in your uh, 
Pew Bibles, it's on page 110 of the New Testament, Luke 24, starting with verse 36. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending you upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. May God add his blessing. Thank you, choir, and also thank you, Dan. So I understand that uh, somewhere here in the neighborhood, they're without power today. Something like 2,500 homes. Glad we have power here, though. We have the Holy Spirit. And we also have electricity. Thank goodness for that. Uh, I don't think we would be uh, live streaming today. Uh, could we do that? We could do that, even without power. That's something different. See, I, I don't know a lot of these things. You have to put the generator plug it in. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, that was a good choir number to go along with the sermon today. Interesting how the Spirit arranges these things. We are God's people. Uh, talking this morning about the mission, the mission of the church. And this is uh, part of the post-Easter series, number eight, if you're keeping track. Uh, but at the end of the series, uh, we'll be going into another series. Uh, next Sunday's Father's Day. I don't know if I'll start next Sunday or not, but I might have to have a special Father's Day sermon next week before we get into uh, the next series of messages. Talking about today, the mission, the Great Commission, as it's often called. The ending of Matthew's gospel finishes with Jesus' words to his disciples on a mountain in Galilee. Some weeks after his resurrection and then his ascension from Mount of Olives there in the vicinity of Jerusalem. You remember how he told them earlier through an angel, first of all, to the women that came to the empty tomb, and then having the women to go tell the disciples that they were to go ahead of him to Galilee, where they would see him. Greetings, do not be afraid. One of the 365 fear nots in the Bible, that's one for every day. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Go to Galilee. There they will see you. Now he had told them, had predicted before his death on the cross, that after I have risen 
I will go ahead of you in a Galilee. That was in Matthew chapter 26, verse 32. So sometimes we need to be reminded of things, do we not? We hear things, but we need to be reminded. So he said that earlier then. Now they're being told that again. After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Galilee is in the north, around the lake, where he had conducted most of his three years of earthly ministry and from where most of his disciples were from. Galilee, beautiful Galilee. We read this in Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. Then the 11 disciples, minus Judas, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Exactly which mountain was clear to them, but not certain to us today. Could have been the mountain for the north where the transfiguration took place. This is recorded in Matthew 17. But that's in the region of Caesarea Philippi, the foothills of Mount Hermon, the tallest mountain in the Middle East, and there on the border of Syria and Lebanon, about 30 miles north of the lake, Sea of Galilee. Another possibility of the mountain is Mount Tabor, which is located to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee, overlooking the lake, also a real panoramic view of the Jordan River Valley and also the Jezreel Valley that comes over from uh, the coast from Haifa. Now, one of my regrets in my travels to Israel is we never got to go up Mount Tabor. We drove past it, we drove around it, but we never went up. Mount Tabor is about 1,900 feet tall, but it's a very steep hill. It's a mountain, but it's a very steep hill. And the reason we never got to go up there is uh, you can't take a bus up there. The road is uh, very narrow and curvy, and there are some churches up there, uh, Franciscan churches and uh, an Orthodox church as well. You can make arrangements of being transported up there by a station wagon. Uh, but if you got a busload of 30 people, we have to take several station wagons. And the guy uh, that we used always told me that you got to count about four hours to get up, to group, get the group up, see around, and get the group back down. Now, there's a basic principle of economics. The real cost of anything isn't what it costs, but what it keeps you from doing. That's a basic principle of economics. The real cost of anything isn't what it costs, but what it keeps you from doing. So if you're going to spend a half a day doing that, that means you're not going to get to be able to do several visit several other sites. So for that reason, I always listen to the advice of my guide and uh, past going up there. I have seen aerial views from there, and it's fantastic, uh, spectacular view. You can see the lake. You can see all the way down the Jordan River Valley, over over to the coast. Uh, so maybe on one of my trips. Uh, by myself or uh, with a smaller group, uh, you always have those bucket lists. If things ever calm down over there, maybe I'll be able to do that somehow. Otherwise, I've seen it from the air. So I, 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 I'm guessing that that's the mountain. And some people think that's where the mountain of transfiguration was. But we know from the context in Matthew 16 that it was in a region of Caesarea Philippi which is the headwaters of uh, the uh, Jordan River. It says that, uh, by the way, what, what mountain, it doesn't matter. What matters is what was said to them on that occasion on the mountain. That's what matters. Which mountain doesn't really matter. That's not what's important. What is important is what Jesus told the disciples there on the mountain. It says in verse 17 that when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. This despite his appearances to them in Jerusalem on that first and second Easter Sunday evenings. Some doubted. Very human of us, is it not, that some would doubt. Even though he had appeared to them, showed them, body, ate fish in front of them, 
just appeared. Even Thomas was convinced, but some doubted. Now, I'm not troubled by this because we know eventually they all became very much convinced of indeed his resurrection. Convinced to the point that they were end up martyred for this belief. Would people really die for something that was, uh, they weren't certain about? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, but some doubted at the time. Now, the reason that Jesus told him to go back to, Jeru to Galilee from Jerusalem is while he had appeared to them there in Jerusalem, he wanted them to know that he wasn't just appearing in Jerusalem, he was also appearing 80 miles north in Galilee. So he wasn't just, the resurrected Lord was not just in Jerusalem, he was also where they had spent so much time with him in Galilee. Further proof, further convincing proof that indeed he had been raised from the dead. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what he's saying to them after appearing to them, some doubted, they worshiped him, they became martyrs. Many of them became martyrs after proclaiming the gospel about his death on the cross and of his resurrection on the third day. He's now saying this to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is very important. His authority came from the Father, the Lord God Almighty. It is where he derived the power to perform the miracles that he did, casting out of demons, healing many diseases, even having power over nature, calming the storm, etc. And of course, where his teaching or his words came from, from the Father. He's now going to be sending his disciples out, changing them from being followers to now becoming apostles. Twelve disciples now are going to become the apostles, one sent, the ambassadors for Christ. He's emphasizing to them his authority and his power, and it's assuring them that uh, he's also going to be empowering them through the Holy Spirit, which came at Pentecost and had dwelt the believers. This authority and this power that he's promising them is derived from God. He's granting to them as he's sending them out in his name. They are to convince and also and to be equipped convince and equip them for this mission that he is about to give them. The mission. It's called the Great Commission. And it's called the Great Commission because of what it entails. What it entails. Therefore, he says, first point, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Nations are people groups people groups. Go and make disciples of all nations or people groups. This is true inclusion. <coughs> the kingdom of God is to be composed of all people groups. Go into all the world, present the gospel to all creatures, to all nations, to all people groups. Go and make disciples followers. This is what they had been called to be. Followers, now he's changing their call to being one of being sent and being an apostle. Becoming a disciple involves indeed making a decision. The decision is to repent of sins, to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, who died on the cross, and to begin a life of following the Lord. Repent, believe, and follow. Repent, believe, and follow. That is how one becomes a disciple. And it begins with a decision. But notice that Jesus didn't say, go into all the world and get people to make a decision. He said, go into all the world and make disciples, followers. Begins with making a decision, but then becomes a lifetime of indeed 
following. So it's a lot more involved than just making a decision, as important that decision is of repenting and believing, but that's just a start of what is to be a life-altering experience, a life-changing experience, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. It's more encompassing than, for instance, I have an issue with my college and seminary these days that's uh, real strong on peace and justice. That's their big thing, peace and justice. And we need, we need peace and justice in this world. And certainly when you follow the teachings of Christ and you follow them out as Christians, we should be involved with peace and justice. But Jesus didn't say to the disciples, go and make peacemakers. He said, go and make disciples. Being a peacemaker is part of what Jesus taught, part of what Jesus taught. And besides, people in their natural state need more than conflict resolution training. If they're really going to be a peacemaker, they need to have a changed heart. And then they can go and offer the peace of God, the peace with God, and they can then bear witness as what a peacemaker as a Christian, a follower of Christ, really is. Well, I got that off my chest. <laughs> go and make disciples, not go and make decisions, and not go and make peacemakers. Go and make disciples, followers of Christ. Secondly, Jesus stated this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All Christians, all Christian denominations promote and practice baptism. All Christian denominations believe and practice baptism. But all denominations do not agree on how or when baptism should be administered. Now, there's a couple hints or notes from the text that gives us some guidance on this. First of all, the Greek word for baptism, baptizo, literally means to dip or immerse or place in. And baptism, really, its origins go back to the Jewish ritual of ceremonial cleansing in a pool of water, a mikvah, that they would do in preparation to uh, acts of worship and things. And then, of course, John the Baptist. He came along. He's called John the Baptist because he was getting people to be baptized. And he did so in the Jordan River. That's where there was much water, it says. So that gives you some indication about uh, uh, how much water should be involved. In one of the places that he was baptizing, it specifically mentions Anon, where there was much water. You know, the Jordan River is not a big... It's not a big river. It's about twice the size of Whipple Walk in most places. And that was a bit of a disappointment. I mean, I'm really not disappointed at too many things in Israel, but, you know, they tell roll, Jordan, roll, and then the big river. It's not a very big river. You can easily throw a stone across it. Uh, and like I said, maybe two or three times the most uh, the width of the, of the Whipple Walk. Um, and that's somewhat because... Um, uh, the Israelis, I know, maybe it was a little bit bigger back then because the Israelis take a lot of water out of the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River to irrigate and uh, so take care of all the populations now in the Holy Land. But nevertheless, it, uh, there were, where there's a curve in a stream or a river, that's usually where it's a little bit deeper. And so John the Baptist was baptized. Calling people to repent after 400 years, there had been no prophetic word. And now John the Baptist on the scene. He's calling Israel to repent, be in preparation for the, for the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, and uh, Jesus appeared, by the way. And uh, Jesus appeared and uh, wanted to be baptized. And John, John was sort of reluctant to baptize Jesus. But Jesus wanted to identify with John the Baptist, just as why baptism is also a mark and identification as Christians with Christ. Uh, and it also says he did so to fulfill all righteousness. Now, you can 
check out all the Bible commentaries you want, but nobody really has a good understanding of what exactly that means. I think it just means that Jesus wanted to, he didn't ask people to do something he wasn't going to do himself. And he was identifying with John the Baptist, his call for people to repent and be preparation for the Messiah. And he indeed also submitted to baptism. Baptism is something that uh, wants Christians to do at the beginning of their Christian experience. And so it's a, a step of obedience. Uh, Jesus identified with John the Baptist, and he was baptized. But he did not baptize anybody. He delegated that to his disciples. Good mark of leadership, delegation. And so Jesus delegated that to the disciples. The word baptizo literally means to immerse or plunge. I could have dropped a paper clip in there, but then it would have stayed in there. You just dip in there and come back out. That's what baptizo literally means, to immerse or to dip into. Now, the second thing that's instructive about this is, notice he said, go and make disciples and then baptize them. The order of the Great Commission is as inspired as the content. The order of the Great Commission is as inspired as the content. Step one, make decisions by becoming a disciple be baptized. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. Do we not? On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a message. 3,000 came to faith and then were baptized. Some time ago, I was promoting these uh, views I have on baptism based, I think, upon the scriptures. And so this lady said to me, well, if you want to be that literal, I guess you ought to be baptizing people in a river. And I said, well, there was no river in Jerusalem where 3,000 were baptized. There was the Pool of Siloam. There was the Pool of Bethesda. And near the temple, there were these mikvahs that Jews would wash themselves in. So there were places that people could be baptized. And Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized. And then we know that that also occurred uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch after he made the decision to believe you're passing water down, to, down near Gaza. And he says, ah, see here, there's water. What keeps me from being baptized? No, nothing. You made the decision. You're now a disciple. You can be baptized. He's heading back to Ethiopia. So the Philippian jailer, after he said, what must I do to be saved? And led the disciples into his home and shared the gospel with him. And he believed in his family. They were baptized. So you always see that order, belief, then baptism. This is what... Mark's a Christian, that they now are indeed a Christian. Mark is baptism. What makes a Christian? Somebody's belief that Jesus died, buried, and resurrected. And that is best portrayed, by the way, in dipping in, coming back up on the cross, buried, come back up to life. Now, there are different methods and modes of baptism. And by the way, uh, just, just the other week, some guy said to me, you're, you're a Baptist, uh, and you're here at a congregational church. How's that? How's that? I said, well, the main difference between Baptists and congregationalists is that we, we are all congregational in our polity, our church government. We're self-governing. We might be a part of some association, but there's no real denominational hierarchy over us like some of the denominations. We're self-governing. We call our pastors. We can also invite our pastors to leave. It could happen. <laughs> Democracy, you know, all that. Uh, we elect our officers. We uh, set our budgets. Uh, we have congregational meetings. This recently when we spent some of that money that uh, we had to have a congregational meeting for. Mary Claire presided over that. Uh, so congregational Baptists are all self-governing churches. We own our property, pay our bills, we have our own budgets, et cetera. Difference is that here at the Congregational Church, if you have been baptized and you're satisfied with your baptism, you give a clear statement about salvation because that's what really matters. A clear statement about salvation that we believe that we're really saved and we accepted the Lord, we believe in the Lord, and you're satisfied with your baptism, regardless of when you were baptized, how you were baptized, we accept that. We don't require you to get baptized in our pool. Well, that'd be good because we don't have a pool. 
<laughs> but uh, uh, some of the baptism in the Church of Christ, you could be bap- you got to be baptized in their pool. And just that you be you know baptized, you got to be baptized. You know, so um, we we don't require that. We do require people to give a clear statement about salvation. Baptism does not wash away our sins. It's only a symbolic thing, identifying with Jesus, death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. So it's a mark. And uh, that's what uh, distinguishes Christians is somebody that's been baptized. And I say all Christian groups, all Christian denominations, some form or another, believe and have and practice baptism. We don't necessarily all agree on this, but can have this discussion. it be going on for 1,800 years, you understand. So we're not going to solve that uh, in any uh, sermon or meeting. That. But the main point is this. Make disciples and then baptize them. Mark them. And then the third point. The third point is this. Final point of the commission, Great Commission. This is very important. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Notice, this is not suggestions. These are not options. When the word obey is used, things that you're commanded to do, these are things that God's word, teaching of Jesus, expects Christians to indeed do. These are things that Jesus taught the disciples by word and by deed, and they were now instructed to go and teach their followers, the people that they made disciples, having made the decision to believe and now made a decision to follow Christ as they're being taught, the apostles were taught and the apostles now are teaching them. This is what truly makes Christians. And it's why the early Christians in Antioch were first called Christians, Christ followers, because they were doing the things that Christ taught and they were following Christ's teaching. Make disciples, mark them by baptizing them, and then mature them through his teachings. Mature them because we all start out as as infants, as babes in Christ. And we need to grow up mature. Now, thankfully, it doesn't take uh, 18, 20 years. Or today, you know, I think it's like 25 years. And they moved up adolescence to 25. Not really. I see some young people back here. Uh, it doesn't take that long to grow up spiritually. But we all start out as babes in Christ, and we are to be uh, grounded in the Word, grow in the faith, and how does that happen? By being taught the Word of God, being taught the things that we should obey, the things that we should follow that He's commanded us to do. This is indeed the mission of the church. To go and make disciples of all nations. That's why it's called the Great Commission, because they were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people groups. Um, the founder of Subway used to live right down the street here, Fred DeLuca. He had a book called The Start Small, Think Big. And he got that idea, I think, from Jesus. He started small but a group of 12, but he was thinking big when he said, you are to take the gospel into the whole world and make disciples of all nations. Started with 12. They've come up with, by the way, the idea size of a small group. Guess what they come up with? 12. Oh, I wonder how Jesus knew that. Oh, he was God. His little group of 12, he lost one, they replaced that. Talked about that last week. Yes, The 12, as he's going back to heaven, he's now turning over what he came to earth to do to these 12, and they were very ordinary people, fishermen or whatever, one tax collector. Uh, He's turning over all this mission to these 12 that he spent three years, I guess that's why seminary is three years, three years of training, he's now entrusting them after he sent the Spirit to indwell them and empower them, after convincing them that indeed he was resurrected from the dead, after assuring them about the authority that he had from the Father that he's now granted to them as they're going out to be his apostles. He's now turning it all over to them to do this. And now we know, of course, after 2,000 years, what 
the largest faith group in the world is Christians, people who are indeed followers of Christ. Starting small, thought big. Go into all the world, make disciples. He limited himself, by the way. Other than that one time he went over to the coast, the woman from Cypro, Phoenicia, basically Lebanon, uh, Jesus pretty much limited himself to about 120 mile territory of what Israel was then. But he now, having accomplished the mission he was sent on, he's given the task to go into all the world with the gospel to these disciples. Indeed, this is genuine diversity and inclusion. Go into all the world and make disciples of all people groups. Heaven is to be populated by people of all nations. And if we're going to, wait, by the way, spend eternity together, maybe we ought to get along together here and now, right? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. If we truly understand that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, what does it matter what color we are? or what culture we are. It really doesn't. If we really focus on the person of Christ and our lives and hearts have been changed, we have that in common and we can worship together. And it's a great time not only here on earth to spend time with the people we're going to spend eternity with, but also to know that heaven is going to be made up and Jesus wants to be heaven to be populated by people of all races, nations, and people groups. That's why he's sending the disciples into all the world. One of those disciples who became convinced was uh, Thomas, went all the way to India. I visited a church in India that uh, claimed it had a part of Thomas's body. I don't know about that, but we do know that he did get the whole way to India. And there's a lot of Indian Christians who had the name Thomas for that reason. And the gospel was spread by the other disciples, all eventually losing their lives other than believe of John who kept the lie because of why he had to write the book of Revelation. And he did so in persecution on the island of Patmos. Churches today that are following the true DI, diversity and inclusion, by going out and sharing the gospel with all people are churches that indeed are growing and are alive. Those that are just into some of the more secular, modern, societal stuff that's going on, and they're missing the fact that you got to, first of all, get people to make a decision to become a disciple. They're just trying to change the world by some social action. It doesn't work. People are sinners, and they need their life-changing experience. It comes from knowing God through Jesus Christ. And then... As we follow the teachings of Jesus as Christians, that's how we can really be a peacemaker and how we can really be his representatives here on earth of sharing the message of love, peace, and joy that Jesus really lived. Let us resolve today and here for going on that not only have we been here since 1895, but that we will, God willing, continue to be a lighthouse here on the shore west part of Milford, reaching out our Jerusalem and Milford to Judea, Samaria, the state of Connecticut, and then out into the world as we do supporting missions in Haiti and Tanzania and through Samaritan's Purse. Really, Samaritan's Purse is everywhere around in the world where, where there's needs being met, being met in the name of Jesus Christ. Those uh, shoe boxes that we gather up, millions of those shoe boxes have been given out all around the world, not only uh, little Christmas boxes, but more importantly, the message of what Christmas really is, the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Let us resolve in the time remaining until the Lord comes back that this church will always be committed to the mission of spreading the gospel, of making disciples, and teaching them everything that Jesus taught. It's good to see the children here today. Uh, that's a very important part of uh, the mission of the church. But we're all God's children, regardless of the ages. And uh, we can study all our lives. And there are things that we can continue to learn new in the scriptures and in the word. And we grow in the Lord by following the things that he asks us to obey. 
and practice. That's the mission. And that's what this church is very much committed to. Amen? Amen. Let us close in prayer. Lord, as we, uh, as we think about your return to heaven after having been here on earth and accomplishing a mission by going to the cross and then having trained these disciples, and he now left that responsibility to them and they told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who eventually told us. And now we have that responsibility as well to not only make that decision ourselves personally to be a follower, but to be a true disciple indeed, doing all the things you taught us to do, including staying and taking the gospel out to our Jerusalem, our Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, to all people groups. We pray for our city, we pray for our state, our nation, and our world. We live in a very troubled, difficult, challenging times. War is going on here and there, signs of the last days, yes, for sure, but you would have us to be watching, not only watching, looking for your return, but to be working and to be sharing and spreading your gospel, your word, to all people. And indeed, uh, you brought the world here. As we uh, notice, as we travel about, uh, we have that opportunity of sharing, even if we don't physically travel somewhere, the world has come here. Just help us this week, this year, this going forward, to present claims of Christ, the gospel, and see people's lives change because, because of that. And we'll give you the praise and honor and glory as we celebrate together, now and for all eternity. We pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now before our joys and concerns, very appropriately, here's a song Karen picked for us to sing, Go Ye Into All the World, number 537, 537.
should add that should there be somebody here today or somebody listening and you've never made a decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ, we're happy to meet with you and pray with you, not making that decision to become a disciple. And if you've never been baptized and you'd like to be baptized, we can help take care of that as well. In fact, one of the things I would like to do sometimes is have a baptism out here in the sound. Probably up there where the uh, fishing pier is, so that people can stand and watch that. And because uh, also you have to go out some ways, you want to do it when the high tide. You can, those, those of you that live down there, high because the water needs to be up about here. So uh, I'm thinking about doing that sometime, maybe in August or September. So if you've never been baptized, uh, the mossy young man wants to be uh, somebody. So I've got to line up a few other people. I've used I've used your pool. To do that, mm -hmm. so uh, but the sound here sometimes probably in August or September might be a little better temperature wise, <laughs> right? Yet on high tide. So, if anybody's interested in, interested in baptism, we can see you about that as well. And now we have the opportunity to share with each other as a congregation our joys and our concerns. I'm going to start with the joy. I've said this before, I get to go first because I'm here. <laughs> Anyway, um, due to uh, a very nice person in the congregation who introduced me to someone else, I was able to have some real fun for a week or so. Um, a person who had been collecting uh, coins in a bucket. And you know, sometimes we, maybe you remember the giant egg we had and some other things that, that I counted because I like doing that. Well, this guy had a honey a uh, Home Depot bucket is a little bit more than five gallons. They're the tall ones. Full. I mean, it, they were running over. Neither of us could pick it up. The way <laughs> I know how much it weighed because we put it into like several things and then I carried it home and weighed the individual things. So it was 170 pounds of coins. Wow. Uh, he was very pleased to find out that there was over $1,900 in that bucket, which I counted and gave him the money for. And now I have uh, to go back through that change again to see if there's anything I want to keep or just roll it up and put it back into circulation, which is what I do. You count it by hand or with a machine? Oh, no, I count by hand. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually very cathartic. <laughs> so yes, so I had a great time for two or three days. <laughs> anyway, if, if anybody happens to know someone else that has a bucket of change they need counted, I'm your man. There you go. Who else has some uh, joys or concerns? Paula. Right. Uh, just to show the, the, the impact that church has on, on the neighborhood, one of our neighbors reported to me this week that there were uh, a couple of folks walking. It's a big walking area, especially if you're going for ice cream. And they stopped in front of the church, came up on the stairs, and had someone take their picture mm. in front of the church. Nice. And it was, I don't know what made them stop, but if you ever wonder, this little church makes... A difference for some reason. Don't know why, but it was. But the neighbors noticed. The red doors. <laughs> it might be the red door. <laughs> There's the blood of Christ. We add it to the church. Yeah. That's yeah. why our doors are red in churches. Are there any any others today? Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. I've been away for a little bit. Uh, it's been a busy month with graduations. I had to go to a wedding. I had an anniversary. So anyways, it's good to be back. It's great to see you all. Um, I did want to just say one thing quick about uh, this church, a little bit of history that you may or may not know. Um, as a nation, we just celebrated the memorial of D-Day, June 6th. 
And I don't know what it was, 10, 12 years ago, I was lay reader, I was doing what Dan is doing, and it happened to be on June 6th. And I made mention of that to the congregation. I said, you know, just, just remember the people who served um, and who landed on those beaches all those years ago and make sure we give thanks for them. Okay? Not thinking anything of it, a gentleman, well, there's two gentlemen who used to sit in the back. Matter of fact, where uh, you guys are over there, okay? So you're sitting in the seat of honor there. Um, a gentleman named John Bobach and his brother, Gregory, he came up to me and John said, I was on Omaha Beach on D-Day, right? So if you've ever, if you saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, it's probably, you know, in my opinion, the uh, most accurate description of what hell on earth would be like. Anyways, John was there. And um, I just wanted to make mention that he and his brother, uh, I got uh, somewhat close to them, uh, which was difficult because they never, they didn't say too much, especially his brother Gregory. And when my youngest daughter was born, I remember he walked in and he had a, a stuffed uh, bunny rabbit toy. And he just walked up to me and said, give this to the baby. And he walked away. <laughs> so that was about how yeah. he was. Um, but anyways, let us never forget um, the people who have gone before us. Uh, we are very fortunate in this country. We are very fortunate in this country. And for any, all you guys that have put on a uniform, whether you, you, you served or not, it doesn't matter. You don't have to wear a uniform to be a patriot. Um, but um, we cannot forget the gift that we have in this land. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I thank John, and he's no longer with us, nor is Gregory. But uh, to me, they will never be forgotten. So thank you very much. God bless. Yeah. It's also John's birthday on that day. Wow. Yeah, he turned 21 on Omaha Beach. My uncle, my mother's brother, was 10 years uh, senior to my mom. And he had gone into the service right about that time and transferred from the medical department into the fighting department. I don't know the names of these yeah. places, but anyway. <laughs> he was a paratrooper who went on D-Day, but he did not survive. So that was a tough one for my grandmother. I always remember him. I have a picture of him on my wall. And, uh, the sacrifices that people make. I, I have a phrase. My daughter and son-in-law. My daughter and son-in-law threw a bingo um, last night for closer to free for um, for Smilo, and they made over ten thousand wow. dollars. That was a big, big. It was a wonderful night. And it was a lot of work, but ten thousand dollars. That is, is just astounding. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, that is astounding. Yes. Congratulations and thank them. Pastor Ken, the, you're talking about how small that uh, river was. We went to Texas and New Mexico, and the Rio Grande li River was a little trinkle. <laughs> it was so sad to see that. My uncle got shot down in, uh, in the war, and my mother knew exactly what had happened because she felt, she felt it go through her, and he was captured. In, uh, okay. Thank you so much for your sharing. We'll take these things. Yes, 80, 80 years ago, June the 6th, and I do remember John Bobak. Uh, he actually was born in Romania and came here when he was like five or six years old. Joined the Big Red Machine in 1940 and fought the whole way through World War II, North Africa, Italy, and then UK. Uh, he stood at the door one day, I was shaking hands, and he said, Do you know God's name? I said, well, there's a lot of names for God, but uh, what do you think? He said, Andy. 
and he walks with me, and he talks with me. That's <laughs> John, John Bolbach. And he must have had and sensed that presence uh, with him. Uh, we can be thankful for our, for our freedom and our liberties today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we, we indeed thank and praise you that uh, we can know you and know the forgiveness of sins and know you as our Heavenly Father. And we can share our joys, our concerns uh, with you and burden, unburden ourselves and then leave it with you there in heaven as you view and see things. We ask that you undertake in ways that will bring you honor and glory that meet needs in Jesus' name. That uh, this would encourage people to indeed uh, keep believing, keep following. And you taught us to pray by saying the prayer about the Our Father. So we Pray that prayer together today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Number 525, make me a blessing. The world needs people to be a blessing. We need to be a blessing to receive the privilege of being a blessing giver. We sing together this hymn. The number is 525.
get a blessing, and you can be a blessing, indeed. So, um, Deborah is our church musician. She found it in a lower key. Uh, I see um, we got Ron back here in the gospel choir Tuesday morning. These ladies here in the gospel choir. So if you want to be abused on Tuesday mornings, not just uh, the choir here on Sundays, you can do that. Uh, they have a good time. And you got a program coming up again when? July 21st. July 21st. Great to see members of the gospel choir and our own choir. You're going to have a practice again today? Yes. So the choir practices after the fellowship time. You get to go first for the food and then come in here and uh, practice with Deborah. Um, May you have indeed a blessed week. Next Sunday is Father's Day. I understand the ladies are preparing a nice uh, kind of following what the men did for Mother's Day. Is that what's that? We got how to do We like that kind of competition, don't we? We like that kind of time. So next Sunday, Father's Day, I encourage uh, dads to be here. And uh, whether our dads are in heaven or whether they're here, uh, we have our Heavenly Father as well. Heavenly Father, may indeed we be a blessing this week, especially to somebody that most needs a blessing.